in the Seattle area. And I'm also a former NFL player playing for the Seattle Seahawks and Cleveland Browns. And I'm going to be joining you guys for the Beast Feast. And, and I'm excited for the Beast Feast, not only just to be able to eat some food, because I hear it's pretty good, but also to bring the good news to you. You know, for men specifically in this cultural moment, it has just been very difficult. They want us quiet. They want us to be too loud. They want us to go away. They say too much men, not enough men. And I think for us, how do we navigate being a godly man in this cultural moment? That's a question we need to answer. And I hope to share some of my insights with you coming up in April. Looking forward to it, guys. Good morning, church. My name is Kinsey, and I have a few announcements for you before service begins. We hope you join us next weekend for our Good Friday and Easter services. We will all join together on Friday at 6.30 p.m. downtown for a night of worship, prayer, and reflection on the sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross. Classes will be provided for children birth through second grade. Then on Saturday and Sunday, we will celebrate His resurrection across all of our campuses. Our downtown campus will have a blended service with our choir and orchestra on Sunday morning at 9.30. We will also have three contemporary services at the downtown campus, one on Saturday evening at 6.30 and two on Sunday morning at 11 in the Worship Center and at 11 East. The Church at Shepherd will have one service on Sunday at 11 and the West Campus will have two services on Sunday at 9.45 and 11. There will be no life groups on Easter, but classes will be provided for children birth through fifth grade. Make sure to invite your friends and family and come celebrate our risen Savior with worship and a message from Pastor Bob. If you're at the downtown campus and you purchased the book, A Princess Story, when Pastor Elijah Soratow was here a few weeks ago, they're available for pickup at the downtown event center. Church, we are excited for a great time of worship as we take the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's worship together. Well, good morning. Welcome to First. My name is Justin Bindle. I'm the pastor of Young Adults and Families. It's a joy to worship together with you this morning. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. You can text CONNECT to 71723, and our pastors would love to answer any questions you may have and help you get connected here. We're excited to celebrate the Lord's Supper and remember all that Jesus has done for us as we enter into the Passion Week and look forward in anticipation to Easter next Sunday, our Good Friday and Easter services. So we'll have our Good Friday service this Friday night and then seven Easter services across our three campuses. And uh, we are in prayer for that this week. I hope you're in prayer. I hope you're joining us in prayer this week. And as we anticipate uh, life change, people coming to faith in Jesus who are going to hear the good news of Jesus for the first time next week. It's because of your faithful giving and generosity uh, that we can make that happen. And we allow space for people to hear the good news of Jesus. And so we hope you're planning to join us next week. And then on Sunday, April 14th, I want to invite all the guys to come and participate in our annual event called Beast Feast. We're going to have tons of great food. I'm excited to have a good friend of mine, Eddie Williams, who pastored with me in Utah for a season. I uh, was the director of Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Utah, uh, played five years in the NFL, and now is a pastor in Seattle, Washington. Uh, he's going to be here challenging us as men and really going to have an encouraging word for us. And so would love you, uh, if, if you, if you're a guy, if you have kiddos, I uh, want to invite those boys to come and participate, eat all the good food. You can buy tickets uh, online in the event center or in your life groups. I'm going to pray for us this morning, and then we're going to take an opportunity to greet one another around us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity we have to gather together as your church, as your people, to celebrate all that you are, all that you've done, all that you're doing. Lord, we look back, we remember and reflect. Thank you that you uh, have given us a space like this to come and worship together as your people. Lord, we look forward to this coming week. Would this week be an opportunity for us to reflect and remember uh, the life you lived and the sacrifice you gave uh, to set us free, to give us and credit us with righteousness. Lord, we give you thanks for that. Lord, I pray for our services this morning. I pray for our pastor, our worship team, as they bring and speak the good news of Jesus and remind us of what is true 
in this world. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take a moment and greet one another around you?
cry. Hosanna. Father, we cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. You're the only one that can. God, and we're grateful that you sent your son to be the perfect sacrifice for something that we could never accomplish. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God, save us. Would you speak to us this morning? We need you so desperately. We love you, we love you, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to Luke chapter 22, verse 14. Luke 22, verse 14. Um, I want to welcome those of you at the church at Shepherd, uh, those of you at our West Campus and at 11 o'clock East. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning, as well as those of you who join us online or on television. And I really want to invite you to be here in person next week. I know some of you join us uh, virtually. But next Sunday, next Saturday night would be a great night for you to come, or next Sunday morning. We want you to be here for a great Easter celebration, and so I want to invite you to do that. What is your dream vacation? What's your dream trip? My in-laws are planning uh, an Alaskan cruise. They've always wanted to do this. My wife helped them make their reservations not too long ago, and so this summer they're going to be on a cruise ship and go to Alaska and see all the beauty that God created there. My daughter has... Uh, watch the movie, listen to the music of Mama Mia, and now she wants to go to Greece, and I hope that someday her husband, her future husband, takes her there. <laughs> Some of you, um, you know, you'd love to go to Africa. I have a friend right now who is in Africa. He's been on safaris. He's doing this incredible mountain bike race. And uh, he's having a fantastic time. It's one of those trips of a lifetime. Some of you would love to go to Israel. You would love to go see the places where miracles took place and where the, the history of the Bible unfolded and walk in the very footsteps of Jesus on some of those same cobblestone streets. Well, for a first century Jew, there was a dream trip. And understand that people did not travel greatly in the New Testament world. Many people traveled in very limited circles. They didn't go very many places. But if you lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem when Passover came, it was a religious mandate that you had to go to Jerusalem. But for every other Jew, those who had been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, Jews lived all throughout the Roman Empire in the ancient world. That's the reason there's a synagogue in every town that the Apostle Paul goes to in the book of Acts. In every one of those places, their dream was to be in Jerusalem for Passover. Because at the end of the Passover, the very conclusion of the Passover celebration, there was a, a prayer and an aspiration that was spoken over the assembled crowd in that home. And it was simply this. After they finished the fourth cup, they would say, next year in Jerusalem. It was a, it was a prayer. It was a hope that next year they would celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. It was their dream trip in many ways. We come now to this portion of Luke's gospel, and we have come to many tables along the way, but none more significant than this particular Passover meal that Jesus will share with his disciples. Jesus um, has celebrated at least three Passovers. This is at least the third Passover he celebrated with his disciples. Um, he's a Jewish boy. He celebrated Passover all his life. But Jesus said this one was incredibly special. I have struggled for the last couple of weeks, especially studying this passage, to try to convey to you the weight 
of what's going to go on in this passage of Scripture. There are moments in Scripture that are just weightier than others. Now, all of Scripture is true. All of Scripture is important in some respect. But this is such a tremendous, tremendously significant moment. Um, in the modern world, we would put up a monument to this moment because it is a turning point in redemptive history. It is a page turner. This is a moment when the old covenant, all that God had promised and all that God had established in the old covenant is coming to a close. And Jesus is going to establish a new covenant, a new way of relating to God. And that's what he calls this. Now, Jerusalem was incredibly crowded during this season. Historians say that Jerusalem in the first century had a population of about 400,000 people. But at Passover, that population would just swell. Uh, the Roman historian Flavius, Flavius Josephus said that on one Passover, there were 256,000 lambs slaughtered at Passover. Now, if 256,000 lambs are slaughtered at Passover, and 10 people eat the lamb, eat the Passover meal. That's 2.5 million people who are now crowded in Jerusalem. I mean, it was like Times Square on New Year's Eve. You could hardly move on that day when Jesus, that Palm Sunday when Jesus rides into town on a donkey and they cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a messianic statement that here comes our king. Now, you take 2.5 million people crowded into this small city, and the aspirations that their Messiah has shown up, and the Romans are on edge. The Roman governor, the Roman soldiers, I mean, any disturbance, they're going to squash this because they can't stand this going on. And that's why some of the tensions that you read about in the Gospels during this week take place. I mean, the Romans were absolutely on edge that the Jews were going to rise up and rebel. So we come now to the Thursday, and I am convinced it was on Thursday. I can explain that later to you, but it's Thursday. And Jesus says to Peter and John, hey, go find us a place to have the Passover meal. And they're like, we don't have reservations? You're kidding me. There's 2.5 million people in town, and we don't have a room to have. What in the world are we going to do? And he says, guys, just go into town. And you're going to see a man carrying a water pot. Just follow him, and he'll lead you to the place where we're going to have a Passover meal. And you're going, a man carrying a water pot, wouldn't that be common? Absolutely not. In the New Testament, going to draw water was woman's work. Sorry if that's offensive, but it was the truth. In John chapter 4, we got a woman at the well. Women went to get water. A man carrying a water pot was an anomaly. This was, that had been socially unacceptable. So Peter and John go, there's a man carrying a water pot. They follow him. Sure enough, there's a vacant room. And so they gather for this Passover meal. And this is how John describes, or rather Luke describes it unfolding. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus takes this Passover meal, and as any good Jew would have done, he takes it very, very seriously. The Passover was incredibly significant. It was the most significant meal of the year for a Jewish family, for the Jewish faith. And so Jesus is going to take this very seriously, but there's something of a transition that takes place biblically in this moment. 
It is so huge. I, I just can't convey to you how big it is, so let me try to explain it. What we have laid out here for us is the final Passover and the first communion. And that's what we're going to unpack. It, it, it really sort of divides itself pretty neatly. So let's just talk about, first of all, the final Passover. And the first question that might pop into your mind is, Mom, how can you possibly call this the final Passover? I mean, this week our Jewish friends will, will, take, will have Passover. Absolutely. They will go through the ceremony of the Passover. But in this moment, Jesus is concluding the Passover, the Old Covenant. And after this moment, there will never again be a need for the Passover. I'll get to why. That's why this is the final Passover in the sense that the Old Covenant is being closed. Jesus was passionate about this. He says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. That phrase could literally be translated, I have desired with desire to eat this Passover with you. I mean, this, this is intense. This is passionate. And the reason for this passion in the voice of Jesus is because this is the purpose for which he came. He had told his disciples over and over and over again the purpose in his coming. His purpose was to come and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was his reason for being here. The cross was always Jesus' reason for coming. Jesus taught a lot of great things. He was a great teacher. That was not his primary purpose in coming. Jesus performed miracles that absolutely prove he is the Messiah, the Son of God, God incarnate. Absolutely, he did those things. But miracles were not his purpose in coming. He came to die. His death was the purpose of his life. And so he says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. I mentioned that he had already eaten a Passover meal with his disciples. These were special times. But Jesus is pointing to this Passover before I suffer. Now I want you to see one thing in that that I think is important for us as followers of Jesus to remember and understand. Especially in a culture where there is a wave of anti-Semitism of anti-Israelite thought, anti-Jewish thought. And that is this. The Jews did not kill Jesus. Let's get that real straight. The Romans were the instruments of execution, yes. But the Romans did not take Jesus' life. Jesus says, I lay down my life freely. No man takes it from me. Jesus gave his life. He knew that suffering was in his future from the moment he was cognizant as a child. He knew what was coming. And he knows it in this moment. Jesus gave his life freely. And he says, I wanted to eat this Passover with you. Now, now what is Passover? What's it all about? You probably need to understand that. Well, the the high watermark of the Old Testament, the, the biggest miracle of the Old Testament was a successive series of movements of God in the book of the Exodus. When Jewish people look back on the Old Testament, this is like the big moment. And it was that for 435 years, the Jewish people had been held as slaves in Egypt. And during that time, they had gone from one family to this, to this huge nation of people the Egyptians got frightened of them. Uh, they thought they were going to take over, and so they, they enslaved them and forced them to, to build monuments and to do hard labor. 400 years of this. And the Israelites cried out to God, and they said, God, why have you forsaken us? Why have you, why have you abandoned us? And finally, the Bible says that, that God heard and answered their prayers, and he did that by sending a liberator, someone to rescue them, and that was Moses. And God sends Moses. And he tells Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go, and Pharaoh refuses to do so. And so God sends 10 successive plagues. By plague, I mean a supernatural act in which God turns nature against Egypt in a, in a very real way. There are 10 aspects of this in which the economic, the social, and the religious structure of Egypt 
are just destroyed. And, and it's, a, it's the mightiest nation on earth at that time. But the tenth plague was big. After God has devastated their economy, after he has crushed all their false gods and their religion is in shambles, after God has humiliated Pharaoh, here's the tenth plague. He says, here's what's going to happen. I am going to take the life of every firstborn in Egypt. Every firstborn goat, every firstborn cow, every firstborn horse, and every firstborn person from the lowest slave to Pharaoh's house himself, I'm going to take the life of the firstborn. Unless, unless you slaughter a lamb and you take the blood of that lamb and you paint the doorpost of your house. In that case, when the death angel, the angel of death is what the Bible calls it, when he comes... He will pass over your house and go to the next one. If there's blood on that doorpost, he'll pass over that one until he finds a house where there is no blood on the doorpost. And if there is no blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the firstborn in that house is going to die. In my house, I am a firstborn. My wife is a firstborn. My daughter is a firstborn. We'd be painting a doorpost. I'm going to guarantee you that. Nobody's going to forget it. And that's what happened that night. The Bible says there was weeping and wailing and grief in Egypt like the world had never seen or heard before. But in all of the land where the Jewish people lived, there was peace and quiet because they painted the doorpost. Now, there are two statements that I'm going to make that are important for you to understand out of the Passover that are biblically true in the New Testament and for us today. The first is simply this. Deliverance from judgment requires death. You say, why? I don't know why. God sovereignly decreed it. Deliverance from judgment requires that someone die. But here's the good news. Deliverance from death can be provided by a substitute. In the case of the Old Testament... It's a lamb that dies so that the firstborn doesn't have to. We kill the lamb. We put its blood on the doorpost. We roast the lamb. We eat the lamb at Passover. The lamb is the one that provides the substitute. And so for about 1,500 years, Jewish people have celebrated this particular moment until the time of Jesus. It happened about 1,500 years before. They remember this every single year. They celebrate this Passover meal. Now, the Passover meal that Jesus is talking about, when he says, I long to eat this Passover with you, was, it wasn't fast food. This was a long, long meal. I mean, there, there was no what a lamb. There, you didn't pull up to the drive-thru and, and get your Passover meal. It didn't happen like that. Okay? You would gather together, just like Jesus and his disciples. There had to be 10 people. If you were a family of three, then we got to gather with some other people. You got to have 10 people because the entire lamb had to be consumed. And what would happen was there was an order. Some of you have experienced uh, a Passover Seder. The word Seder means order, like program. It means the, the way things are done. And the Seder or the order of the Passover is that once you're gathered, there would be a, a prayer of thanksgiving by the host, whoever was hosting. And then there would be the first of four cups. And those cups are important. And the first cup was a cup of, of blessing. It, it, was, it was the cup uh, of thanksgiving. And that cup would be taken um, in the very beginning of, of the meal. And when Jesus, uh, when Jesus begins this meal with his disciples in verse 17, we're told that when he had taken the cup and given thanks, so that first cup is the cup of thanksgiving, but that's not the cup that he's going to establish the Lord's Supper with. He simply gives thanks. Then there would be a symbolic washing of hands. It symbolized the need for cleansing. Then they would all recite Psalm 113 and 114 called the Hallel. They would begin to recite this, these scriptures. I don't have time to do all this this morning. Then 
they would take some of the matzah, the unleavened bread, and they would dip it in bitter herbs, usually horseradish. And that, that bitterness of the horseradish would remind them of the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. They would take parsley or lettuce or cucumber and they would dip it in salt water. And the salt water was to remind them of the tears that they had shed in Egypt. And then there was also a little pasty substance made usually of fruit, probably apples and uh, nuts and fruit and spices. And it was a little sweeter than the rest, and it, but it looked like the mortar of the bricks that they made when uh, they were in slavery. And so everything in this meal had a, had a symbolic element to it. And then they would begin to eat the lamb. And as they ate the lamb, the host would recite what is called the Haggadah. The Haggadah is the story that I just told you, but he would tell it in great detail. And so it would take a long time to tell the story of them being taken into slavery and all of the plagues. He would detail all of those things all the way down to the Red Sea moment when the God parted the Red Sea, Israel escaped from Egypt, and then God crushed the Egyptian army. The final blow to Egypt and to Pharaoh was the drowning of the Egyptian army. And then they would take the cup, the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. Now that's what Jesus took when he established the Lord's Supper. But the cup of redemption is the cup of, of rescue, the cup of salvation. And so as you ate this lamb and you heard this story over and over and over again, you would understand that death, that deliverance from God's judgment requires death, and deliverance from death could be provided by a substitute. So I've got a question for you. It's a question that a lot of people ask. So in the Old Testament, were people saved by the sacrifices of these lambs? I mean, if, if you're doing what I'm doing right now, which is I read through the Bible each year, I've been reading through numbers, and they give you details on how to offer all these sacrifices. And I read some days, and I, all I do is, say, Lord, thank you for grace. We don't have to do that anymore. That's, that's what I got out of my Bible today. Thank you for grace, okay? So were they saved by that? Let me tell you, the answer to that question is no. The answer to that question is no. The blood of goats and bulls and lambs does not forgive sin. The book of Hebrews says that. So what's this all about? All this animal sacrifice. If, if on one day 256,000 lambs are sacrificed, I mean, what's it all about? Well, sin always has a price tag. And in the Old Testament, every time a lamb was slain, it was a little bit like well, it's a little bit like this. You go to a restaurant this afternoon, and you get the bill. And you see the bill, and you give this to the waiter or waitress, or they bring one of these little things to your table, and you do this. And it's paid for. Like, it's a miracle, right? Plastic is fantastic. I mean... <laughs> this is worth about two cents, but I got a $50 bill, and they just let me swish slide this thing, and, and it's taken care of, right? I paid for it with this. I go, to the, um, I, I go to the clothing store. I go to Academy this afternoon. I run up about $300 of Nike and, and Under Armour, and I go up and I slide that in there, and poof, presto, it's paid for. May I suggest to you something? This is not a finance lesson, but it is something for you to remember. You don't pay for anything with a credit card. A credit card is a promise that you will pay. And what has happened is that your merchant or your restaurant has accepted Visa or MasterCard or Discover or American Express's word that they will pay them. And so... When you slide that credit card or you insert that credit card, it's a promise that payment will be made. And then eventually it has to be paid with a transfer of real money at the end of the month or whatever it may be. So here's what I want you to understand about the Old Testament sacrificial system. We took the Lord's name in vain.
you shall not commit adultery, but we did. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. And every time we sinned, there had to be a sacrifice as a promise that payment was coming. The Old Testament sacrificial system was a spiritual credit card where we racked up a debt. Where those in the Old Testament racked up a sin debt. And then on the cross, when Jesus was near the end of his life, one of the final things he said was, in Greek, tetelestai. It is finished. Paid in full. The debt is gone. The good news for New Testament Christians is it wasn't just the Old Testament debt that was paid. It was the future debt that was paid. That's yours and mine. You see, that's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking to him in John chapter 1, verse 29, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God. This moment, He becomes the final Passover Lamb. That is the full and complete sacrifice. And when I read my Bible, um, I realize I'm a little nerdier than some people. I get it. But sometimes I read things, and they bother me. And I'm trying to figure them out. Now, critics would kind of pounce on this kind of stuff. They say, see, there are errors in the Bible not really, if you study enough. There probably aren't. But here's one of the things that's always bothered me. Now, I believe that Jesus and his disciples ate this meal on a Thursday night. Historically, uh, first of all, biblically, the Passover takes place on the 14th day of the month of Nisan in, in the Bible. That's a, a Hebrew month. On the 14th day. In A.D. 30, when Jesus probably died, I believe that too. In A.D. 30, the 14th of Nisan took place on a Friday. And so it is very much every possibility that he, he ate this meal on that Thursday night. Now, how in the world then, if Jesus and his disciples ate this meal on Thursday night, how is it that when the high priest Caiaphas and the rest of the Sadducees dragged Jesus before Pilate that they refused to go in to see Pilate. They want Pilate to come out to them. In John's gospel, in John chapter 18, verse 28, the Bible says, Then they led Jesus to Caiaphas in the, into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium, so they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. Why had Jesus and his disciples had the Passover on Thursday night, but the Sadducees were waiting to eat it on that Friday? Why was that? Is that a contradiction? Answers no. Harold Honer, who was a distinguished professor of New Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote an incredible book called The Chronology of the Life of Jesus. And in that book, he describes and explains how this took place. And here's how it took place. Now, I know it's a little nerdy, but follow me. I'm really going somewhere here. We render days from midnight to midnight, right? That's how we render days. In Judea, and especially for the Sadducees, they rendered days, the traditional Jewish way, from sundown to sundown. The Romans... And the Greeks and Gentiles rendered days from sunrise to sunrise. And you think our time zones are confusing, right? In the ancient world, Jesus was raised in Galilee, sometimes referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee was infected because Galilee had been uh, the part of Israel that had been taken captive first in the captivity. They had intermarried with other people. It was where Samaria was, uh, just south of that. And, and, and they had intermarried with other people. There was a large secular influence. So in Galilee, they rendered time 
the Roman way, from sunrise to sunrise. In Jerusalem, the Sadducees said, no, we render time from sunset to sunset. Hear me out. The reason Jesus and his disciples had the Passover meal on Thursday was because at sunrise on Thursday, it was the 14th of Nisan. And so they slaughtered their lambs at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on that 14th of Nisan. But for those in Judea, the 14th of Nisan started at sundown that day. And they didn't slaughter their lambs until 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And it was always 3 o'clock. The Bible says that Jesus died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on that Friday. He closed the old covenant with the final Passover. Then he himself became the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice. He became the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world at 3 o'clock on that Friday. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. I confess it was a little nerdy and it took a long time to get there, okay? But this is how history sometimes solves the mystery. And there are these moments in Scripture that are so significant that we just kind of fly over sometimes. So let me get to the first communion. So in the course of this meal, the Bible says that after they had eaten, he took another cup. That was that cup after they had eaten the meal. And that's the cup of redemption. And it is that cup that Jesus takes, along with some of the matzah, of the unleavened bread, and he establishes a new covenant. He says, first of all, this bread is going to take on a new meaning. This bread is going to take on the meaning of my body. Look at verse, verse 19. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He says, this is my body in rem it, it, that's given for you. Jesus is our substitute. He, it is given in our place. He, as the Lamb of God, took the punishment that I deserved. He died the death that I deserved. And so Jesus says, this is my body given for you. Now there is a bizarre idea that is in some branches of Christian religion that I just need to confront here. And that is that some people have this idea that, the, that with a priestly blessing, that the bread literally becomes the body of Jesus. It's called transubstantiation. Don't worry about it. It won't be on the test. You don't need to know that. We do not embrace that. It was a symbol of his body. It is a symbol of his body. First of all, when he institute this, it can't be his body. His body is there. It's fully intact. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He's saying, this bread is my body. So it's a symbol of his body. But what does it do for us? Here's what I want you to know that it does for you. The bread reminds me that Jesus suffered in my place. In a few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And I want you to experience for just a moment the reality that that bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus. The Bible says that he bore our sins in his body. The Lamb of God took your sins and mine and they were nailed to a cross and he died for them there. As my substitute in my place. When you take the Lord's Supper today, I want you to think that through. Secondly, he took the cup. And the cup reminds me that the blood of Jesus is the only way to be forgiven. Jesus says in Luke's gospel, Luke records, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, Luke was not in the room. Luke talked to eyewitnesses, and he recorded what they told him. Matthew was in the room. And Matthew records it just a little bit differently, but we ought to know this. We learn things from all four Gospels. Matthew records in Matthew 26, verse 28, 
that Jesus said, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want to say something to you before we take the Lord's Supper. I want you to understand this. Is God forgiving? Answer is yes. He is gracious. And he is merciful. And he is loving. If this passage doesn't say anything else to you, I hope it says to you, God loves you. He loves you so much that he made a way for you to be forgiven. There is a flippancy about the mercy of God sometimes that says, I sinned, yeah, but God will forgive me. God forgives. Let me explain this to you. God forgives sin, but God only forgives sin through the blood of Jesus. Without trust, without you believing in the shed blood of Jesus, sir, this has been declined. Do you have another way to pay? Without the blood of Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sin. The blood of Jesus is the only way anyone will ever be forgiven. The blood of Jesus is the only way anyone will ever be saved. The blood of Jesus is the only way anybody will ever go to heaven. It is that that exclusive. But once you have received it, isn't that a reason to rejoice over what Jesus has done for you? And isn't that a reason... To bring people with you next weekend to Easter. Isn't that a reason to share this message with people around us? Do you need any more motivation? There's not another way for your friends and for your family and for your loved ones to go to heaven when they die. This is why this is urgent. And so I want to ask you this morning to take the elements that you've been given. And take that little piece of bread. Would you just remember with me for a moment? This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus then took that cup. And if you'd take that, carefully remove that seal. This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said he would not take the cup again until he took it in the kingdom. Jesus said, I'm coming. He came. God said, I'll send a Savior, and he sent him. He kept his word. Jesus says, I came to die on a cross for your, for your sins. He did it. He kept his word. Jesus said, in three days, by the way, I'm going to come back, and he did. So let me tell you this. Jesus said, I'm coming back, and he is. And our job is to have as many people prepared for that as possible. Let's pray together. Father, We come to you with full hearts and the realization that our salvation is not up to us or based on anything that we have done, but it is purely and completely on the grace of a God who would love us so much that you would sacrifice your only begotten son to die a death I deserved, to shed blood so I could be forgiven and set free. We love you, Jesus. And we are so overwhelmed with gratitude at what you've done for us that we will respond in worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, our pastors will be here at the front. We're going to sing a song, and then I'm going to ask you, if you need to receive Jesus this morning, you come.
there's no better day than today. Let's sing together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all. Hey, would you take a seat for just a minute? We have to do something real quick. We do at this point every year. I promise it will be brief and painless, about two minutes, but we have to actually have a business meeting. That's the kind of church we are. Our chairman of deacons, Mark Jennings, done a fabulous job, and he's going to come and preside over that. Thank you, Pastor. Well, aren't you glad you were here this morning? <laughs> what a message. I'd like to call the church back into business session. 
On Wednesday night, March 20, we had a discussion of the proposed budget and then recessed that meeting until this morning. The Budget Review Committee has recommended and the deacons have endorsed that our church budget for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025 be established as, wait for it, $9,150,000. Amen. The committee's recommendation will serve as a motion and the deacon's endorsement will serve as a second to the motion. We now come to the time to vote on that budget. So would all those in favor of this recommendation please indicate your support by saying amen. amen. Would any be anyone who opposes this recommendation indicate their opposition by saying nay? That motion carried unanimously. This concludes our business meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate you. Well, let me just say this. A $9.15 million budget is a big challenge for us, and so it's going to take all of us pulling together. But we have always walked in faith financially. You have always responded by being obedient to the Lord, and I challenge you to do that again this year, that our missions and ministry might continue to carry the love of Jesus to our community and to our world. God bless you for being here today at all of our campuses. Go tell somebody about Jesus and invite them to Easter.